support us by subscribing, ring the notification bell, press all, and thumbs up. Thank you. Starts October 1st of 2018 and runs through September 30th, 2019. Today you will hear from our Acting Commissioner, Mark Morgan. You will also hear from our Deputy Commissioner, Robert Perez. They will deliver brief remarks and then they will open it up for a few questions. We ask that if you have a question that you state your name and your affiliation and ask your question and allow others to ask their questions as well. Thank you again for joining us and may I introduce you to the Acting Commissioner, Mark Morgan. Uh, good morning to everyone, and again, thank you for being here to discuss this year's uh, border security, humanitarian, and trade statistics for the Customs and Border Protection. I'd like to acknowledge uh, a couple of folks that are with us here today uh, who are an integral part in everything that we do in this great state of Texas and this great city of El Paso. First is Steve McGraw, who is the uh, director of the uh, Texas Department uh, of Public Safety and El Paso judge. Ricardo Sabanegro. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. And also, we've, uh, we've got the leadership here of uh, El Paso with us as well uh, from uh, CBP. And, you know, it's, I wanna, it's, it's appropriate that we have uh, our, our partners uh, with us here today because as law enforcement professionals, um, it's a team effort. Sometimes we refer to it as a team sport, both with our law enforcement uh, partners but also the communities that we serve and protect each and every single day. And as you can see behind me, um, unfortunately, they, they've been standing here a little bit longer than, than I would have wanted in the sun out here. But what you have is the men and women of the Customs and Border Protection uh, personnel from the El Paso area. Standing behind us, you have individuals representing the 60,000 plus personnel uh, within the Customs and Border Protection that are stationed not just in the United States, but in numerous countries throughout the world. Behind us, you have individuals from our Office of Field Operations, United States Border Patrol, and our Air and Marine Branch, and you'll see a lot of people that are not in uniform, the professional personnel that are an integral part of everything that we do as well. These men and women serve on the front lines of our nation borders protecting more than 66,000 land border miles, 2,000 coastal miles from the air, land, and sea, working 24-7, 365, often in austere environments. They're out there every day protecting this great nation. They, as well as their families, sacrifice more than most understand or could comprehend. You know, we just lost a United States Border Patrol agent, Agent Houghton, marking the 127th agent that's died in the line of duty. For you, for me, for us, and this nation, 127 Border Patrol agents have given their life. After this press conference, I'm actually headed to meet another agent, Agent Tenna, who just recently, while he was trying to stop a, a criminal who was trying to avoid a checkpoint in a stolen vehicle, was hit by another vehicle, and he had to have his, a, his leg amputated. He's actually had two operations now, and his leg is actually amputated above the knee. This past weekend, I had the privilege to uh, attend the IACP annual conference where a Border Patrol agent, Jonathan Morales, received the IACP Officer of the Year. Agent Morales was off duty. He was attending religious services at a synagogue a Jewish synagogue in California, when a coward, a disgusting coward, entered the synagogue and, became, and began his killing rampage. Officer Agent Morales, he wasn't armed, and he stood there, but what he did know was the synagogue had a weapon that was inside the synagogue, unfortunately, in case something like this happened. He made his way to that location, and he recovered the firearm. He didn't know it, but it was a revolver. He opened the cylinder, there was only four rounds in the cylinder. But what did he do? He closed that cylinder, he got up, with only four rounds and a revolver, he pursued and closed the distance with an active shooter with a long gun. He pursued him, he forced the active shooter outside as the coward ran from 
Officer Morales. Officer Morales engaged him. He fired multiple times. He missed a couple of times and hit the vehicle. As he closed the distance, he pulled the trigger one more time. Unfortunately, he'd ran out of ammunition and the coward drove away. For that, he received the IACP Officer of the Year. And make no mistake, these actions that I just described, this is who they are. This is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is our character, and this is what we do every single day in this country. Make no mistake, this country is safer because of their efforts, sacrifices, and their dedication. They have and continue to secure our nation's borders, enforce our nation's laws, save lives, maintain integrity in our immigration system, and our rule of law. And they do so with humanity and compassion. After seeing firsthand the crisis that we faced for too, far too long, anyone who says this is a manufactured crisis, they're just lying. They're misleading the American people. And it's not honest. And it's not just about the humanitarian crisis. We haven't done a good enough job talking about that there's much more to this crisis. There's also the national security crisis along the southwest border. Illicit narcotics are pouring into this country. Last year, 68,000 people died because of overdose of illicit narcotics. The year before, 70,000 people died in this country. And it's not just about drugs and overdoses. Criminal aliens and gang members make their way to and often past our borders every single day. These bad actors and drugs make their way into every town, city, and state in this nation. If you have an overdose in Ohio or Detroit, and I could keep naming the states and cities, more likely than not, that drug came from the southwest border. We don't talk about that enough. Now let me walk you through some of the facts for fiscal year 2019 regarding how the men and women, how these men and women standing behind me worked every single day to protect this country, all while facing an unprecedented crisis along the southwest border. And keep in mind, they accomplished what I'm about to, to, to tell you. When Congress, our own Congress, refused to get off the sidelines, refused to do their job to pass any meaningful legislation to protect this country and address the loopholes in our current legal framework. Congress knows exactly what they need to do, and I know that because I personally have told them, yet they have been unable to put one piece of legislation even on the floor, even on the floor of Congress to end this crisis, and they could. So let me give you a few stats. Nationwide, CBP's apprehensions for FY 2019 totaled 1 million 148,000, more than 970,000 along the southwest border alone. This is a staggering 88% higher than the fiscal year 2018. These are numbers that no immigration system in the world can handle, not even in this country. And each month during the fiscal year, the numbers increased. You saw them. We all saw them surpassing record highs for families and unaccompanied children. As we recall, during the month of May, a total of 144,000 individuals crossed the border. In just a 24-hour period, we recorded more than 5,800 people in a single day back in May. And on a single day back in May, we actually had 20,000 individuals in custody. We had a capacity of 4,000. Again, staggering. Family units, 473,000, the highest uh, uh, year on record, and a 342% higher than FY18's previous high. Unaccompanied children, 76,000, 26% higher than FY18's total. And what we don't talk enough about, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about it, and, but I'm also going to tell you about what we caught. And there's some more numbers that should, should be staggering and should worry you and concern you. But what we don't talk enough about is what we don't catch. We estimated that over 150,000 individuals got away. 
I think that personally is conservative. You think about that, 150,000 got away. And at the peak, um, we had more than 40% of our Border Patrol agents pulled off the line. At any given time, we had 731 CBPO officers that were pulled out of the ports to deal with the humanitarian crisis. This absolutely made our country less safe. And what continued to drive and pull Central American families to our borders was the public knowledge that the United States immigration laws were filled with loopholes. And they were coached and mentored and given what to say by the cartels and the human smuggling organization. You grab a kid and that is your U.S. passport. That will guarantee you entry in the United States. The cartels were taking out ads and they were telling these vulnerable families and this vulnerable population, you grab a kid, you're in. And guess what? They were right. I gave you the numbers of what we had to deal with. All while the cartels and human smuggling uh, uh, organization, they got rich on the back of these people. They treated them like trash. They treated them like a commodity. They abused them. And it happened every single day in FY19. And this is what we've been trying to get Congress to get off, their, get off the chairs and get involved and pass meaningful legislation to stop this. But as Congress sat idly by, as they continued to do, this administration's strategies have brought about dramatic results. As you know, September marked the lowest uh, numbers in a month since this crisis be began. Again, you remember back in May, 144,000. Last September, 52,000. Each of the last four months of the, the, the uh, fiscal year, we had a dramatic reduction in the number of apprehensions. We have worked tirelessly to have other countries in the region, Mexico, the Northern Triangle countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, they have stepped up to really see this as a regional crisis that it is. And we are working with them every single day, targeting gangs, human smuggling organization, trafficking organization, and the movement of illicit drugs. And that's exactly what is happening. Mexico, the Northern Triangle countries, they have stepped up and it's made a dramatic difference. The president, and the men and women of CBP, the men and women again right behind me, are restoring integrity to our system and the rule of law. We're closing the loopholes that are driving these individuals to turn their lives over to the cartels to be abused and treat them nothing more as a commodity. Diminishing the smugglers' ability to make billions of dollars on their backs. We have essentially ended catch and release along the southwest border. The message that's going out now for the first time in a long time is if you grab a kid, it's not an automatic passport in the United States. We are shutting those loopholes down. We are communicating that out. They know that there are consequences to the actions and we're seeing the numbers go down because of that. Although we've achieved an incredible success, there's more to do. The crisis isn't over. The bottom line for us is Congress still needs to pass meaningful legislation to address our broken legal framework if we're going to have a durable, meaningful, and lasting solution to this crisis. Now, let me talk quickly about something, again, that we don't talk enough about, the national security crisis. You know, our bandwidth has really been taken up a lot on the humanitarian side for obvious reasons. But let me talk to you a little bit about why this is also a national security crisis. While we were dealing with more than a million apprehensions, as I said, we also seized 750,000 pounds of drugs. Think about that. 750,000 pounds. All the hard narcotics, methamphetamine, cocaine, uh, heroin, and fentanyl, all the hard narcotics, seizures went up in 2019. And think about that. While 50% of the border patrol resources and a good source of the officers were pulled off the line, seizures actually went up. That, that should worry us all. That's, it's not just a humanitarian crisis. It's absolutely a national security crisis. CBP, let me give you a few more stats. CBP personnel seized more than 75 million in illicit currency and 1,700 inbound weapons, up 300% from last year and over a thousand outbound weapons, nearly 60% over the previous fiscal year. We apprehended more than 16,000 criminal aliens, 
thousands with convictions for violent crimes, sexual assaults, drug, tra drug trafficking, as well as homicide. Think about that, 16,000. This should alarm every citizen in this nation. Behind virtually all of these threats are transnational criminal organizations, or TCOs as we call it. They're highly mobile. They maintain sophisticated uh, cross-border networks and engage in a wide range of organizational criminal activities, firearms trafficking, drug smuggling, human smuggling, human trafficking. If, if, if it's not just a human smuggling organization, they'll do anything and smuggle anything to make a buck, and they're doing it every single day at our expense. TCOs, they've taken full advantage of the humanitarian crisis, using families and kids as a diversion to get the bad people and the drugs into our country, and it's happening every single day. And those drugs and those criminals, they're finding their way into every town and city in this country. I can't emphasize enough, it's not just about the southwest border. What happens at the southwest border is entering every town and city and state in this great country. We need to make sure we're talking about that more and everybody understand that. CBP arrest of criminals and gang members nationwide of, of, of the criminal gangs, members 1,200. That's up 20% from the last year. And again, I, I hope this is sinking in. 750,000 pounds of drugs, 1,200 gang members, 16,000 criminal aliens, and almost 3,000 weapons. And that's only what we don't catch. Much more is getting past us. It's staggering. It's a national security crisis. And again, keep in mind, we, that's, that's just what we catch. We, all those resources that we had pulled off, but every single category, our seizures and apprehension of drugs and bad people getting in went up. Think about that. We, we should be worried. Everybody should be worried. And each day Congress fails to address the humanitarian crisis, it's at the expense of our national security crisis, which is at the expense and safety and security of our neighborhoods throughout this nation. You can't separate the humanitarian crisis and the national security crisis. Our ability to secure our borders, it also impacts our economic security. Ensuring efficient, secure supply chain and safe and efficient lawful trade and travel is imperative for a strong economy. So when I talk about the Customs and Border Protection, it's amazing what we do. It's not just about the humanitarian mission. It's not just about the national security mission. It's also about the economic mission, about the lawful uh, 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 transportation and facilitation of trade and travel. CBP in fiscal year 19 processed more than 414 million travelers. Think about that. Four 414 million travelers. That's more than a million travelers per day. In terms of trade, CBP officers processed 2.5 trillion, that's with a T, 2.5 trillion in imports and screened 28.7 million containers, ensuring that the goods coming into our country are safe and legal and cannot harm our citizens or our economy. CBP also collected approximately 40, I'm sorry, 74 billion in du duties, taxes, and other fees. That's an increase of nearly 59% in duties over the previous fiscal year. And if this wasn't enough, and it is, CBP personnel, and I, that's why I started with what I did about uh, uh, Agent uh, Hotman, and, and why I talked about Agent uh, Tena, and why I talked about Agent Jonathan Morales, who won the IECP Officer of the Year. Here's another statistic that tells you a story about, about who is standing behind me right now. In fiscal year FY19, CBP, including a lot of people standing right behind me, rescued 4,900 individuals. 4,900 individuals. From risk of drowning in rivers and canals and dying in the desert, or an abandoned locked tractor trailer. They didn't ask these individuals what their nationality was. They didn't ask these individuals, are you entering this country illegally? That never happened, and it never does in these circumstances. What the men and women of CBP, what these very men and women behind us saw was a human being in need of help and distress. 
And they immediately went into action 4,900 times, risked their own lives to save these individuals. Yet, how many times is that reported in the media? How many times have you reported that? That's why I say here, and I say it with pride, and it's easy for me to say, they are my heroes each and every single day. This is who they are, this is their character, and this is what they do. No matter what you'll hear some members of Congress say or the media say about their character, which is simply not true. And finally, I couldn't walk away without talking about the wall. Since we are here in front of a section of, of, of a, a great section of new wall, um, I, I think it's important that I tell you a little bit about the updated status and progress. We now have completed 75 miles of new wall. Let me make that clear. 76 miles of new wall along the southwest border. And I'm here to tell you, there's another false narrative out there. I've heard it so many times that, well, th th this is the president's vanity wall. Well, I I'm telling you right now, that's just a lie. That's not true. The wall represents exactly what the men and women of the Customs and Border Protection ask for. The experts have asked for this wall. The leadership have asked for this wall to enhance their capacity and ability to effectively carry out their mission, to give them enhanced ability to have operational control over their AOR to do their job to safeguard this country. And it's not about keeping good people out. It's about keeping bad people out. It's about keeping drugs out. They've killed 68,000 people in this country last year. And it's about making sure that the cartels don't become a multi-billion dollar industry every year at the expense of citizens in this country every single day. The men and women of the United States Customs and Border Protection have asked for this wall, and this president has delivered. And I am confident by the end of 2020, we're going to have 450 miles of new wall built along strategic locations along the southwest border. And it's not just a wall, it's a wall system. It's got integrated lighting and technology and access roads. So that's why I can confidently say the truth is 76 miles of new wall have been built. And the truth is, and the reality is, that some individuals entering this country who cross at the southwest border make their way into the interior United States and commit serious crimes. If we're going to have a rational and intellectually honest debate over this issue, we must acknowledge public safety issues imposed by some, not all, who illegally enter this country. That is the truth and that is the reality. The wall serves to impede and increase our ability to apprehend criminal illegal aliens before they make it into the interior United States, before they make it to your neighborhoods. That's the truth. The truth, the wall, it increases our ability also, as I said, to stem the flow of illegal narcotics pouring into our country. The truth is that what goes on at the border impacts the, every community in this country. The wall gives CBP the opportunity to more effectively detect and prevent drugs from entering our country and killing our citizens. If we miss it, it's coming to you. If we miss it, it's coming to your city. If we miss it, it's coming to your neighborhood. That's the truth and that's the reality. Now, I would like to invite Deputy Commissioner Robert Perez to provide some context and background behind these numbers. The Deputy Commissioner has spent over 26 years of his life de dedicated to this mission and protecting this country. He is an invaluable leader. He is my confident, uh, confidant. I learn from him every single day. I deeply appreciate that he's here today. Deputy Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, it is truly my honor to be here with you today and with these, with these incredible professionals standing alongside either one of us. So what I'd like to do is very briefly maybe just touch upon a couple of the main points that the commissioner just said that I think worth re-emphasizing and repeating. Um, it has been an absolutely unprecedented year for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, and all of us, all of us who've been in this incredible agency owe a debt of gratitude to the entirety of the 60,000 of the employees who have persevered through challenges unlike anything I've seen in the over 26 years of my career, many of which are standing right behind me. So if I can very briefly just share with you a, a few thoughts that I think, again,
very important, worth uh, re-emphasizing. First, um, the incredible and unprecedented level of collaboration we've had on the international front. Uh, I see uh, our dear colleague and friend, uh, Ricardo Hernandez, who is the De Deputy Counsel General here in El Paso. Ricardo, thank you for being here with us. Um, it is uh, an unprecedented level of collaboration we've had with our Mexican counterparts, with our counterparts in the Northern Triangle, that in the tail end of this fiscal year, as you heard the Commissioner mentioned, have given us a different bit of this ongoing challenge, in, uh, ongoing challenge, insofar that the reality of what it is we're facing, both on the humanitarian crisis side and the ongoing national security crisis, is different now. Uh, and it is different, by and large, by this unprecedented level of collaboration. A level of collaboration that we are going to continue to pursue, that we're going to continue to find innovative ways to mature, uh, and that needs to persevere. Uh, because absent, permanent, meaningful, durable, and lasting change that Congress only can enact, uh, these, these collaboration and these partnerships that we have uh, are ever more critical. Uh, make no mistake about it, folks. We need Congress to act. We will also continually to re-emphasize that point uh, because that is a point that is so, so critical to the entirety of this agency, to the entirety of this department, and frankly, to the entirety of the country. The second point that I want to emphasize is the community here in El Paso. Uh, you all, by and large, have been literally on the front line alongside us in so many of the challenges that, again, you have seen up close and that the Commissioner just laid out for you by way of all the enforcement actions and the challenges we've had over this fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you for epitomizing a community of uh, supporting the entirety of law enforcement, certainly all of our own here, more than 3,000 who call El Paso home, but the entire law enforcement community here. We, we all, alongside each and every one of you, faced some incredible challenges over the course of this last year, and we can't thank this community enough for what it has done to work alongside us, even when we might not agree on every bit of the solutions that need be put forth. You all stand, stood and continue to stand with us. And so we are very grateful. Know that your CBP family here is here to do everything it possibly can to keep this community safe and secure, as well as the communities around the country. And the last point that I want to reemphasize that we can't emphasize enough is the incredible work of these wonderful men and women, many of which are just standing right behind me. These CBP professionals absolutely epitomize our core values of service, vigilance, integrity every day. They do put honor first in everything that they do every day for this wonderful community and for the entirety of the nation. The Commissioner and I could not be prouder of these heroes. And as he mentioned, just this past year alone, these incredible professionals affected over 4,900 rescues, rescues of people they encountered crossing the border. Every day, these agents and officers and all our support personnel put their well-being and their needs behind those of whom they serve. And we couldn't be prouder and more grateful. And right now, I'd like to actually hand over the microphone, the podium, to one of those individuals who are truly one of the heroes that the commissioner referred to. Last week, right here in El Paso, Border Patrol agent Luke Gallagher was awarded the Law Enforcement Congressional Badge of Bravery. He went above and beyond to save an individual from, a, from dangerous waters along the American side of the canal. Congress created this award back in 2008 to honor those in law enforcement who have shown exceptional bravery in the line of duty. And so that you can hear his story straight from him, I'd like to now invite Agent Galicki to share his remarkable story with all of you. And thank you again for being here today, folks. Luke? Sorry, just give me a minute. Uh, Commissioner Morgan, Deputy Commissioner Bettis, Chief Chavez, and other distinguished guests and visitors, 
Uh, I want to thank you for letting me share one account of the countless rescues and intervention performed by CBP personnel and also highlight CBP's long-standing practice of providing aid to those in distress and the saving of human life. It was a little over two years ago. Uh, I was a brand new Border Patrol trained EMT and it had been a particularly deadly month of August. We had multiple fatalities in the river and the canal. And that month I had also assisted giving CPR to a 17 year old girl who my fellow agents had pulled from the river. On August 27, 2017, while patrolling less than a half mile west of where we are now, on that day, two subjects illegally entered the U.S. less than 100 yards from where we're standing. While attempting to evade arrest and abscond back to Mexico, both subjects jumped into the American Canal and were almost immediately in distress. I responded from uh, my position, and when I arrived on scene, other agents had already attempted to throw rescue ropes and throw bags to the subjects, which they were unable to grab. Both subjects unfortunately succumbed to the strong currents of the American Canal. Luckily, I was able to see one subject's arms moving underneath the water, uh, and then that's when I made the decision, and I knew that I had to go in the canal in, other, in order to save that person, otherwise he would surely die. So uh, I tied off, went in the canal, was able to reach him while my partners pulled me and him to safety. Once out of the canal, he wasn't breathing and had a very weak pulse. So my partners began CPR. Thankfully, the subject started breathing again and regained consciousness. And I just want to say that I'm very proud of the fact that as a team, we were able to save a life and preserve human life that day. I appreciate the recognition for my actions, but the true credit lies with my partners who also risked their lives that day, and the men and women of CBP who risk their lives every day, so others may live. So here's what I would ask. Can you report that? Can, can, can you, just a couple of people, write about what you just heard? Because that's what represents the men and women behind me. What you just heard was real, from the heart, genuine. He represents and he embodies the law enforcement spirit. He embodies the CBP spirit. He embodies the true character of the men and women standing behind me. And again, I'm proud to be associated with this organization. I'm proud to be standing here, and they are heroes. And you just heard a story of one of the heroes. So before I wrap up, again, I wanna make sure that we understand that this is a complex, difficult crisis that we face. CBP uh, does a tremendous job carrying out its vast, complex mission as well. But make, make no mistake, this is both a humanitarian and national security crisis on our southwest border. We have to get together. We have to do things, meaningful things, on a bipartisan way to pass legislation, to not only deal with the loopholes in our current legal framework to stem the flow of illegal uh, immigration, but also to address the criminal element pouring into our country, the drugs pouring into our country, killing citizens, every single day. There says since we've been here, um, citizens of this country have died from drug overdose, and more than likely, those drugs came from the southwest border. So before I turn over some questions, I would like to ask if, the, uh, if Director McGraw or the judge would, uh, would like to say any words. Good, Judge? Sure. Well, thank you. I guess most of you are wondering why a county judge would be here at this event. I'm not here philosophically and I'm not here as a politician, but anything that takes place in our community, we should be involved. You know, the crazy thing is there might be aisles out there in, in federal government, but in local government, there shouldn't be any aisles. We should be as concerned as anybody else. We have the platform, we have the, the voice, we have a lot of opportunities. So if we're not here, and elected officials are somewhere else, they're missing out on learning, they're missing out on 
what needs to happen. I want you to remember very clearly that the people, the men and women behind us here, they're from El Paso, they're part of our community, they went to our high schools, our colleges, their families live here. So whenever you have some kind of understanding or misunderstanding about their role, then we're saying something about our own community because each and everyone represents our community. They know our community values. They know how we interact. They know what we expect from, from people that are born and raised here in El Paso. We have a beautiful, amazing community. And I think that more than, than less than we're doing is we as, as elected officials need to be and step up and be at the same table. And I hope that that message is loud and clear that I could either be watching it on TV and, uh, it, or being here getting the kind of knowledge and information. Uh, people like uh, Chavez and, and Mr. Mancha, they are part of our community. They educate us. They get us to understand what, what's happening here. So anybody that's interested in helping our community, in being part of our community, has to respect what people are doing. And you know, there's an expression, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I'd rather be at the table trying to understand what needs to take place, having my voice there. And it was very generous this morning that I was able to express my comments and my understanding. And so once again, I, I challenge our leaders, there's no aisles at the local government. There are no aisles. If there are, we created them. You might have them in, in Congress or at the Senate and all these other places. Here, please, let's get together, let's work together, let's make things happen as a community we always embrace everybody that comes in. We shouldn't leave anybody out of that formula. Thank you. Judge, I, I, I couldn't have said it better. I, I agree with everything you just said. And, and Steve, again, thank you to you personally for your leadership and the men and women and the support that you've given us and this community and the entire state, but specifically El Paso. And also I'd like to thank Greg Allen, the chief of El Paso PD and Sheriff Wiles as well. Uh, again, I think this, you know, there, there's several reasons why we picked El Paso uh, to be here to roll out these stats. One, I personally lived here for two years. I called El Paso my home. As the judge said, standing behind me, they represent about over 3,000 Customs and Border Protection personnel that live here and make this city their home. And when I lived here and I worked here, I never experienced a partnership both within the community and the law enforcement profession stronger than it's here in El Paso. Uh, that's why we wanted to come to your city to roll out our stats. So with that, Bob and I will, will step up and uh, we'll answer whatever questions you have. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, Bob Moore from the Washington Post. Uh, you mentioned the uh, downward trend uh, over the last few months in family units coming from uh, Central America and credited the efforts of Mexican and Central American partners for that. One area that where we're seeing an increase is in Mexican family units uh, uh, coming across, uh, uh, I think, uh, the, the numbers of uh, inadmissible Mexican families have, have uh, doubled in the last couple of months. I was just wondering if you could talk about how you plan to address that and what you may be asking Mexico to do as part of that? Yeah, so that, a good question. So what we have here, and this should illustrate to everybody, I always say this kind of tongue in cheek, but I'm serious that the, the Mexican cartels and the human smuggling organizations could really teach a, a business class at Harvard, right? Because every single time we attack the current tactics and techniques and procedures we call TTPs, they change and develop new ones. So we've stemmed the, stemmed the flow to a great extent from the Northern Triangle countries. So what do they do? They go to Mexico and they start taking out, taking out social media ads and going to Mexican uh, nationals and telling them, if you grab a kid, that's your passport in the United States. And so, they're, they're, again, uh, because we have so many loopholes in our current legal framework, it's a loophole. So we've gone back, we're working with the White House, and we're, we're trying to, to use with, and develop new initiatives within the current legal framework that we can apply to the Mexican families as well. Uh, again, uh, making sure that we're supporting in a humane and, and compassionate way uh, everyone, but making sure that those who have legal claims are processed effectively and those that aren't, they're also returned. 